What's up? I'm B, and whether you are watching this on YouTube or you are listening to the podcast, I hope you are having an amazing day. Today, we are going to be doing a recap of the most recent 24 Hours With episode posted by Paul and Morgan. Now, this is their third episode in this series, and this episode is with Josh Benson. Um, the first two that I've covered, the first two episodes that I covered were reactions, and I figured if this is a series that they're going to continue doing, maybe I should try doing a recap. I want to see what you guys like better because I do like doing the reactions. I like being able to um, like see things in real time and like give my immediate thoughts and then kind of just chat about them in like a really authentic way. But I feel like because they're having conversations, there's a lot of stretch of like stretches of time where I'm just like taking it in and I'm listening to what they're saying really intently and trying to like parse through it. And so then I started thinking, maybe for number three, we do a recap. Let's go ahead and give that a try. See what you guys like better because if Paul and Morgan continue this series, I'm going to continue covering the episodes that they put out and I want to do it in a way that works best for you, the person who is going to be watching or listening to it. So like I said, this episode is with a man named Josh Benson, and you may or may not have heard of him. He doesn't really get a lot of negative attention in the fundy space, and so um, he, he's somebody that like I would follow. I follow the It's Church Chad page because I think it's funny, not because I'm like, oh, what are you doing? I got to keep up with what's going on in case I need to talk about it on the YouTube channel, right? So um, Josh has about 38,000 followers on his Instagram, but then he and a friend named Caleb have the page called It's Church Chad, where they post skits and short videos poking fun at things that you probably have experienced if you're involved in a church. <laughs> also, Josh and Paul and Morgan have very publicly disagreed on things, and they've gone back and forth a little bit. Nothing too extreme or too like dramatic, but just they've publicly disagreed and they've kind of called each other out online. And so I do think it's cool that Paul and Morgan decided to invite him to be a part of the series. And I'm glad he said yes. And I was really excited to see where this episode went. So let's go ahead and do win for the week. And then we will move swiftly on into the recap. If you are new around here, a win for the week is just where you share something positive that happened to you over the past week that you would consider a win, big or small, whatever it may be. If it made you laugh, if it brought you joy, if it made you feel grateful, whatever it is, if you consider it a win, I want to hear about it and celebrate with you. If you are watching this on YouTube, you can leave it in the comment section down below. And if you are listening to the podcast on Spotify, you can leave it in the Q&A for this particular episode. My win for the week is that I got to go to Good Friday service with my husband, my parents, and my grandma. I live about an hour away from my parents, and so even though we go to the same church, we go to different campuses, so we don't always get to sit together on weekends. Like Sometimes they'll come out to our side of town and go to service with us, but not all the time, and so um, it was nice to have them come out on Friday and to be able to go to Good Friday service together and sit together and then go get something to eat after. It was just really fun, so... That is my win for the week, and I cannot wait to hear yours and celebrate with you. Also, Easter weekend will have passed by the time this goes up, but if you do celebrate it, I hope that you had a great weekend and um, were able to celebrate in a way that was meaningful to you. And if you don't celebrate Easter, I hope you just had a great weekend. Now, let's go ahead and get into my second attempt on filming this recap because, yeah, it's my second attempt. This truly has been the week of like shooting for the moon, but landing amongst the stars. The first video um, that I filmed got corrupted and I could not salvage it. So that was a bit of a bummer, but that's okay. I'm grateful to uh, have the time to go ahead and film it a second time for you and get it up because I thought that this was a really, really good episode and I'm glad we get to talk about it. So Let's go ahead and get into the recap of 24 Hours with Josh Benson, parentheses, Church Chad, Bar, Paul, and Morgan. This episode starts out with a montage. We see some clips of times that Paul and Morgan and Josh have disagreed publicly online. They gave us a preview of some of the topics that they'll be talking about, including voting for Biden, abortion, the border, and the concept that just because you are 100% sure about something that you believe doesn't mean that that's always the correct thing. 
Then we get the intro message where Paul and Morgan read off the vision for this series the same way they did in the last 24 hours with episode that they did with Bethany Beale. And then they give us a more personal introduction to who Josh is, what's going on with his life, and the interactions that they've had in the past. We had the opportunity to spend the day with Josh Benson from Church Chad. Huge shout out to Josh and Sydney for being down to film episode three while being one month into living with their new baby girl, sleep deprived in the trenches of new parenthood. Keeping it real, we've had online disagreements in the past. I may or may not have wanted to punch Josh in the face. So the question now is, can we squash our beef face to face? We talked through hot topics like Trump versus Biden, pro-life versus pro-choice, modesty, edgy Christian memes, and much more. Grab the fire extinguisher because this beef is sizzling. They give us the intro card where they show Josh's name and then we get some b-roll footage of an airplane, scenery, highways, all that good stuff. And then we get another card that tells us it's 9 30 a.m at the Benson household. They talk a little bit about Josh being a new dad and what that experience has been like for him. And Paul graciously says that even if they disagree on everything else they talk about today, at least he'll be able to say that Josh is a good dad. The vibe is relaxed. They're all just kind of hanging out in the kitchen with, of course, Paul and Morgan, Josh, and then Josh's wife, Sydney. And um, they're waiting for the food to get there because they ordered some breakfast. And Morgan does say that uh, Josh's days have started beginning at 3.30 in the morning because he's a new dad, but they weren't going to show up to his house that early, so they adjusted their schedule a little bit for this filming session. So the breakfast gets there, they're chatting, they're eating, hanging out, and then the topic comes up of how Josh grew up in a town that was not very diverse. And Paul asks him to share a little bit more about that, and then Josh explains that it was a lot of white people, and that the line between Christianity and Republicanism was very blurred, and it wasn't until he graduated that he started to question that a little bit, because when he was going to college, that was around the same time that Trump was running for president. He says that it was at this time he started seeing a lot of people who were leaders in his church saying, quote unquote, the quiet part out loud, and that there was a black pastor who had expressed concerns about Trump, and he saw the way a lot of people's perception of this pastor changed because before he was like very celebrated, very loved people really like looked up to him and respected him. And then when he started being outspoken against Trump, the public perspective kind of shift, shifted and he saw that happening and he was like, oh, and that um, caused him to really start questioning a lot of things. We get our next card, 11 a.m., a walk in the park. Paul, Morgan, Josh, and the baby are all going for a walk. Paul and Morgan ask Josh about how Church Chad got started and he says that during COVID he was really bored so he started making videos but nothing was really getting any traction and then he started to post videos that were kind of making fun of some of the things that he would have said in his earlier days and they do show a few examples of the type of skits that Josh puts out and uh, one day one of his videos hit 300,000 views and now this is what he does according to Josh. They move on to sharing their first impressions of each other, and Josh says that he thinks Paul and Morgan tend to be legalistic, and Morgan talks about how when she made a response to his response to a video that they had made where they mentioned him, she may or may not have said that she wanted to punch him in the face, and he laughs and says that that's okay because she's not the first, and uh, then they talk about his content a little bit, the kind of feedback that he gets from Christians. And he says that a lot of people tell him that he wants to be a part of the world and question whether or not he's actually saved. But he says that he runs his videos by his wife before he posts them because she is very strong spiritually and that she has vetoed some of his ideas and um, some of the videos that he wants to post. But he knows that if she's approving something, then he's probably in a good spot. Also, I meant to say this before I started with the recap, but I'll just go ahead and throw it out there now. This is me like condensing the series of events and trying to capture mostly the spirit of the conversation as well as some details that I felt were important and details that I thought you might want to um, hear about. If you hadn't watched that video, it's like, what would be really important to include so that you could understand the vibe, the intent, the spirit, the energy, all of that. And so, of course, this is subjective. This is me making notes, but you know, I tend to be a little bit long-winded is a nice way to say it. And so my notes are very much the same. 
So I think I included quite a lot, but of course there were like some smaller things that were just like, okay, we we don't necessarily need to like recap that thing specifically. So if you want to like know exactly what happened in the video, feel free to go watch it. But if you just kind of want an overview and like the main points of conversation, hopefully I've got you covered. Anyway, their conversation continues and Josh says that a lot of things that Christians disagree on just seem to be legalistic to him, like whether or not it's okay for a woman to wear a bikini or whether or not it's okay to swear. And we hear Morgan chime in from behind the camera. Things that people disagree on aren't necessarily issues of salvation and Josh agrees with that. Then we get our next card, 1 p.m., golf course. This is a hefty section of the video. So Paul, Morgan, and Josh are all in Josh's car driving to the golf course, and they talk about Reddit a little bit, of course. How could they not? Especially after the last episode, like, of course they have to bring up Reddit. So they're talking about the Fundy Snark sub and how um, people on that sub don't necessarily come for Josh, but they do come for Paul and Morgan. And Josh said that he notices that they uh, do get a lot of negative feedback on there. And they do talk a little bit about the kind of criticism that Josh gets. And he makes a joke that public school Christians are more likely to like him, but homeschooled Christians are the people that come for him. And Paul's eyes light up because, of course, he was indeed homeschooled. And let me just say, no hate to homeschoolers from me because I was homeschooled um, for part of my schooling career, I guess we'll say. Um, yeah, I was homeschooled. And then when we moved to Arizona, so my parents could be part of a church plant, my mom started working full time and I had to go to public school. And let me tell you, I was not a fan. I loved being homeschooled and I wish that I could have been homeschooled all the way throughout high school, but it ended up being fine. So anyway, I loved being homeschooled. No hate to homeschoolers or uh, kids who were homeschooled. But of course, Paul had to be like, <gasps> you know, be very dramatic about Josh being like, yeah, if you were homeschooled, you're probably going to come for me. They move on to the topic of evolution, and Josh says that he does believe that God created Adam and Eve, but he believes in evolution to an extent, and Paul appears to agree with him. Morgan is the one filming, um, so she's like in the backseat, and we don't see her at all. Paul's the main person engaging in the conversation, and so uh, Paul and Josh have a little bit of a debate on how old the Earth is and whether or not Earth was actually created in seven days. Now, if you are unfamiliar with this story in the Bible, the way it's presented is that um, God created, you know, earth and the seas and livestock and man kind of day by day by day over the course of seven days. However, the Bible does not say how long each of those days were. So uh, there tends to be a debate on whether or not we're going like literal 24 hour days or if it's just saying like, I don't know, like, like a, a unit of time, over seven units of time, however long those may or may not have been, God created the earth. I personally, I'm not like a literal 24 hours in a day creation story believer, but that's just my opinion. Josh says that he thinks the earth is billions of years old and says that the Bible doesn't specify how long each of those days referenced in the creation story was. And he thinks that God is very intentional and probably took his time creating things like water. And he goes on to say, like, just think about like the vastness of water. Think about the ocean. You don't think God was like very intentional and took his time with that. But um, Paul believes the opposite. And he says that he thinks the seven days should be taken literally. Josh goes on to say that he knows some Christians who believe that uh, Satan is the one who put dinosaur fossils on the earth to trick people. And he asks if Paul and Morgan fall into that camp. And they both thankfully say that they have never heard of that concept before. Then Josh and Paul start playing golf together. And Paul asks Josh about boating, boating for Biden. Voting for Biden in 2020, and I think that Josh's answer is very interesting, and Paul's face is very telling. But I will say, I posted a reel, I don't know if you remember this, a while ago, back when I was posting more of these types of reels, and it said something to the, to the effect of, uh, I do not see how a Christian could vote Democrat mm. in today's political landscape. Hmm, funny. Yes, but not funny, haha. -ha. Funny weird. And you actually commented on it. And you, you push back on me fairly hard. Yeah. And in your pushback, I can read the pushback, but you actually said in 2020, 
that you voted for Joe Biden and that Biden, his morals lined up more closely with your morals or something to that effect. Sure. I'd, I'd love for you to, to expound. I mean, just off the bat, it's tough to vote for a guy that has trials already, if we're just calling a spade a spade, you know? Um, I think the big thing, and it's kind of a cop out that a lot of Christians lead on is the uh, abortion take of like, oh, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm adamantly pro-life. I can't vote for, you know, a Democrat. I think it's interesting. This was something that Andy Minio posted back in 2016. So I don't know if it's still accurate, but it was like the previous 30 years of presidency. And basically the point was that regardless of whether we had a Republican or Democrat in office from like 1970 to 2016, the abortion rate went down. So you look at something like that, it's difficult for me to then look at Trump and Biden and say, oh, well, me voting for Trump is really going to push down, you know, again, playing kind of devil's advocate because I feel like the pro-life topic is what gets a lot of Christians. Absolutely. It's tough for me to sit here and see that and then be like, oh, well, I have to vote. My hands are tied. Otherwise, you know, abortion rates are going to jump to the roof. They dive deeper into the topic of abortion. And Josh says that while he and his wife are pro-life for themselves, he kind of implies that he doesn't know what they would do if um, his wife, Sydney, did get pregnant. And then at some point, the doctor came to them and said that by her continuing the pregnancy, her life would be at risk. He also says that he has empathy for people who have been assaulted and are pregnant as a result of that. And he doesn't feel like it's right to force them to carry a child. And ultimately, he doesn't think that whether he votes Republican or Democrat, his vote is going to have an impact on the amount of abortions that happen. Paul and Josh go on for quite a while, just kind of like debating back and forth it's it kind of frustrating to watch because the the whole intent of this 24 hours with series is to like try and find common ground i thought it's like let's have unity let's bring us together even if we believe differently like we can still get along right like that's kind of how it was presented but the the tone of the conversation especially in this section and like the rest of the conversations they have while, while they're on the golf course is like it feels like paul is trying to catch josh in a gotcha moment but he can't catch him in one like it, he'll be like oh do you regret voting for biden do you think this do you think that and, and josh will be like no <laughs> like i don't regret voting for biden because i felt like at the time he aligned most closely with my morals and so that's the choice that i made and it's like it's not about finding where they can agree it's about well you believe this and i think it's wrong but let me hear you defend it kind of like that's the vibe if you know what i mean so anyway, Josh and Paul are just going back and forth and Morgan has been filming this whole thing and listening this entire time. And then uh, you hear her speak from behind the camera though and she says that she sees a lot of women who've had abortions after being assaulted say that they regret the abortions and that it hurt their healing process because they chose violence as a result of someone committing violence against them. And Josh essentially says that um, this conversation would be a better conversation to hear Morgan and Sydney have because they're the ones who can actually have kids as opposed to him and Paul just going back and forth. And I agree with that because respectfully, I'm not particularly interested in hearing two people without uteruses going back and forth on whether or not women should have the right to um basic health care access. So even if the conversation went the exact same way, but it was between Morgan and Sydney, like I would probably still be frustrated with some of the talking points, but it would be far less patronizing because it would be happening between two people who have uteruses. Anyway, Josh asks Paul if he thinks that if Trump got back into office and just completely outlawed abortion across the board, if we would see abortion numbers actually going down. And Paul says yes, because according to him, you can see that that's already happening in states where stricter enforcements have gone into place. And Josh theorizes that um, the reason that that number is going down is because it's actually the number of reported abortions and safe abortions um, as opposed to abortions in general because if people can't get them from a medical professional, they're going to find a way to do what they feel needs to be done. It's wild to me that this is not a concept that has occurred to Paul before. Um, that like the thought that just because you outlaw something means that people aren't going to do it anymore. Um, yet yeah, we're, we're going to see if you if you limit people's access to abortion, we're going to see reported abortions going down. But just because something is legal doesn't mean that people stop doing it. It just means in this case that 
they are less likely to be able to do it in a safe way. Paul goes on to say that he believes people take cues from strong leaders. So if there's a strong anti-abortion message coming from the president, he believes that people will follow suit. They keep talking about this for a few more minutes with Josh saying that he thinks Paul is equating pro-choice with being pro-abortion or pro-death. But just because someone is pro-choice doesn't mean that they want abortions to happen. It just means that they're aware of complicated situations that may arise and they don't feel good about having a blanket uh, no on abortion. And Morgan says that women have the right to choose a lot of things, but they should never have the choice of whether or not an innocent life dies. They eventually move on and Morgan asks if four years later Josh feels good about voting for Biden and he says he thinks he made the right choice, but he will say that despite Trump being an idiot, he is so funny. Paul then reads the comment that Josh left them about voting Democrat, and he says that he felt Biden aligned more with his values, and Paul wants to know what values uh, Josh felt that he and Biden aligned on. And Josh says that he thinks Biden treats women better, and that he thinks Trump is a fraud pandering to Christians like they're idiots. And Paul asks, what good fruit has come from Biden? You think Trump is a fraud, but Biden's saying he's a a Catholic, but super super pro-choice. You think think he's not? I think Trump panders to us, tries to pander to Christians. Uh, Then you look at that interview where the guy's like, well, what's your favorite verse or book of the Bible? And he's like, I like both testaments, old and new. They're both great. You know, (laughs) and and it's just like he he panders like, I love Jesus. And they're like, well, what's your favorite verse? I can't say I have one. They're all great verses, really. That's what I say. They're all great. (laughs) And you're like, dude, like you're not authentic at all. Uh, so I think he's a fraud, and I think that he's... So you think, him. because I, I hear you kind of going after Trump and saying, I, I don't like this about Trump, I feel like Trump is this. Mm-hmm. But as far as Biden goes, though, like what good fruit is coming out of a Biden presidency I mean, he for do, a Christian? He do be sniffing hair, for sure. Okay. Uh, okay. I will say this uh, about Biden, and again, I don't know these guys personally, I know what is reported. I saw a video the other day of Joe talking about losing his first wife, okay. uh, and kind of how that affected him, and the love that he has for his sons. And so if nothing else... I can say, well, hey, at least from what I've seen, Biden hasn't cheated on his wife. He's loyal to his family. You know, again, I can't do a deep dive on his, uh, you know, personal. He's definitely family. loyal to his family. Loyal to Hunter. <laughs> not wanting to. Does that have to do with the drug problem? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not voting for Hunter Biden. I'm voting for so you, you. They then start to discuss immigration, and Paul and Morgan describe Josh as having a more empathetic view of it. Josh talks about how there should be a vetting process, but sometimes it can take years to legally immigrate and how some people are running from really dangerous situations and how he has a friend who was born in America, but both of his parents are legal immigrants and getting to know them really changed his perspective. Um, And then uh, as they're having this conversation, they have to move because there's a guy approaching the hole that they're standing at. And so they move on and we just see some footage of them playing golf. Then they resume the conversation with Paul asking if Josh would say he aligns with the Democrat view on immigration, and Josh says that yes, he would. Despite Josh saying he believes there needs to be a vetting process for people coming into our country, Morgan decides to present a straw man argument, and Josh call- he calls her on it in like a, a tactful way, though. Um, it's kind of hard to hear this section because of the wind, but I'll see what I can do to make it a little bit easier to hear. Uh, but if it's if it's tough, I apologize. Just like really focus in on what they're saying, I guess. Maybe close your eyes. Maybe that'll help you hear better. What about all of the violence that's been going on? At school shootings with white people? <laughs> no. Um, like a woman was just recently in Georgia. She was yeah. on a run and she was murdered by an illegal immigrant. I agree. There has to be a better solution for these people who are fleeing a terrible place or, you know, innocent children who don't like yeah. you need a safe place absolutely like we've got to figure that out but also like we've got to figure out how to keep the violent criminals who are crossing freely being handed ten thousand dollars and then going off and committing murders there has to be a solution to that too and yeah. so like a lot of people say close the borders and bring these other you know people in who are coming in safely or, or legally like we'll help them like, yeah. we want to offer refuge for refugees we want to of course yeah, whatever i think you see my my point with my my statement and that's it's very interesting to me kind of the discussion around an illegal immigrant kills someone. Like we said, we should have shut down the borders. Mm-hmm. A school shooting happens where a white kid shoots the school, which is just as horrible. Mm-hmm. And then the conversation, well, hey, it's a sin problem. It's not a gun. It's not a violence problem. So I think to kind of go there, I think there is a violence problem just in general in the United States. Uh, 
and that's a whole other discussion for another day. But I don't know if sitting here and like shutting down the borders, hey, now people aren't getting killed. Now it's great. Yeah. Um, when I think that the vast majority of immigrants coming from South Pole are not killing people, they're just trying to make an honest living, which is great for the economy. All right. Well, yeah. a more empathetic approach. Let's golf. Let's golf. This is another thing that the more I think about it, the more dumbfounded I become. Because how, as a Christian, as like two Christians, Paul and Morgan, do you say that Josh has a more empathetic view on immigration and not stop to be like, oh, we're describing his view of this thing as empathetic. We believe something that's like on the complete opposite end of the spectrum than he does. So if his view is empathetic, what is our view? And does that align with the type of person that Christ has instructed us to be? Like the fact that they don't have that, ooh, hold on moment is very puzzling to me. So then we get more clips of Josh and Paul playing golf and Paul does almost hit someone with a golf ball. Then we see a Patreon ad and then we get our next title card, 3 p.m. lunch. They're all back at Josh's house, Josh, Paul, Morgan, Sydney, and their little baby. Um, they're sitting around on the couches talking about another public disagreement they had. And I'm not sure when this conversation happened, but the incident that they are referring to that like sparked the conversation and the disagreement happened like three years ago. So they're talking about Chandler Moore, who is um, a, a Christian worship artist, and he is part of Maverick City Music. And he's 29 right now. And apparently when he was 26, so like three years ago, right, he posted a couple of photos from his wedding night and like actually from the wedding. And one of those photos was his wife twerking on him. And he was like, she knows how to twerk. Hashtag hallelujah. Hashtag praise Jesus. Something like that. Right. And so it's just like a silly, fun, lighthearted post. Anyway, at some point, Paul and Morgan made a video talking about how they believed th that this was inappropriate, and Josh left a comment on it saying that their video was awful, and then he made his own video, which was a skit, where he was acting as a wedding guest who was approaching Chandler, saying that he just felt convicted to come and tell him that his marriage had gotten started off on the wrong foot because of that inappropriate post. They continue talking. They take the conversation a little bit further, though, beyond just this isolated incident. And they talk about how it relates to modesty and the way that a lot of Christians grow up hearing about or not hearing about sex. And Sydney talks about how growing up near the influence of the Southern Baptist Church, she's heard a lot of stories about people struggling to have sex once they're married because it makes them feel unclean. And so she loved seeing Chandler and his wife being free and showing that side of themselves. They continue to talk more about modesty and how their views differ, and they show a video Josh made where he was poking fun at Paul, and um, he had taken a clip of a video that Paul had done with their friend Michael, and Josh lip-synced over it, and this clip was um, Paul and, and Michael talking about women wearing bikinis. I was looking for a wife, I was like, I want a woman who is stylish and modest, who can look good in a swimsuit, but still not be showing everything. I think Michael and I both would appreciate a woman that is showing some, is discretion the right word? Discretion? Women? You are called to like think about your brothers and think about and, and try to, to help them to not stumble, to stay pure. Morgan shares her thoughts and says that she is so concerned about modesty because her body is her husband's and that women should be seeking the Lord in all of their choices. I agree with one of those two statements, um, and that's like seeking God in, in your choices and how you live your life um, as a Christian. Like, that's something that I try to do, and so I don't have a problem with her saying that. Like, seek the Lord if you're feeling unsure about something or you're not um, like confident in a choice that you're making. Like, go to scripture, pray, do whatever you got to do um, to like make sure that you're living in integrity with your faith and the kind of person that you want to be, right? But um, when when we start to like when we start to verbalize and believe and promote the concept that my body is not my own, my body belongs to my husband, that's where I think we're um, we're we're on a dangerous path. Okay, I think that saying that can lead to a pretty toxic relationship dynamic and. I don't know. I, I will say 
Um, when I was like first married, I was very concerned about that and like how my husband would feel about certain things that I wore. And I would ask him, like I would put something on. And and I think that I've always just been like kind of self-conscious about modesty just because of being raised in the church and like hearing people talk about it a lot. And then also developing quite young, um, having people like make unasked for comments on my body. Like that was always just something that I was like, Ooh, um, a little bit like timid and trepidatious with. Right. So I would ask him like, is this okay with you? Do you mind if I wear this? What do you think about this? And thankfully I married somebody who was like, I don't care if you like it, wear it. You look great. You know, um, that was his attitude, but I can only imagine if I had married somebody who was controlling or possessive or really wanted to be the one to like, tell me how to dress, like tell me if I could wear something or not wear something just because it was based on his own opinion and his whim. Like, as somebody who was very willing to be like seeking out my spouse's approval on whether or not something was okay, that could have led to something that could have led to a relationship dynamic that was not healthy. It's been a long time since I thought about how I used to do that. Now I feel like I need to go give my husband a hug and be like, hey, thank you for being um, an emotionally healthy person and not wanting to control me, but like wanting to be my teammate and my partner in life. I appreciate that. Moving on in the conversation, Josh has a pretty cool take on the onus of modesty and how we talk about it. I was listening to like this podcast with N.T. Wright. He's talking about um, the story of the adulterous woman in the Bible. And the first thing he says, he says, it's very ironic that the the title is quite literally just the story of the adulterous woman when it takes two to tango. So it should have been the story of the adulterous man and woman. It's not the Bible that did this, but we see kind of Christianity almost adhere to the societal norm, even way before Jesus of like, we need to kind of shame women a bit, look down on women a bit, a bit more control on women. Like, look at this adulterous woman we need to stone. Forget the guy that participated in the set. He's he's fine. He's just, boys will be boys. When I hear just a multitude of guys just talking, talking, and again, Paul, you were not the first one. Guys that just keep on harping like, ladies, this is how you should dress. Fellas don't want a guy that, or want a girl that dresses like this or that. Well, to your point, Morgan, exactly right. Like, it should be kind of on every woman and man. There's a lot of immodest dudes I see. Yeah. In the gym, you know, shirtless, yeah. you know. It should be on every woman and man to kind of like personally just like interact with the Lord and be like, how can I best have like a modest heart posture with you? And this is kind of my personal opinion. I don't know if you find this super biblical. When it comes to maybe gender specific issues, if we're talking about how women should dress, I always lean to the side of a woman should have that conversation with a woman and like man with a man. And then this led into a conversation where Josh's wife, Sydney, made a point that I love. I saw a post again on Twitter. The statement was, men, you're responsible for your eyes and your thoughts. Women, dress modestly. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Hmm. (laughs) Mostly. Mostly. (laughs) Because scripture is very, very clear. Jesus like, gouge your eye out, dog. Like, if you got a problem. And then when we talk about dressing modestly, see, I still hear you say that. And my mind goes to it of like, (laughs) I know. and I know you're not saying this, but my mind's like, Paul's asking, or that tweet on X is asking (laughs) women to literally like, turtlenecks in July, pants only. There's truth in that that statement. Um, but again, like, was it a man that said that? It, Probably. Yeah. It, at some point, it's just like, we're always talking about women. And it's like, can men address men for a second? Yeah, when you're going to address just the... like, just it, don't like, I would like to see one time where men hold other men accountable and don't bring women into the conversation. When are we going to address the, the Christian fitness influencer that's like shirtless in the gym? Because oh, women are, women, yeah. like, whether we we believe it or not, like women are constantly being like under a microscope of like what they need to do and whether they ask for it or not are being told what what they need to wear, what they need to do. And it's like, (laughs) I would just really like find so much peace in seeing men like make one statement, like holding another, like other men accountable to their role in Christ and their role in the church and their role with women without bringing women into the conversation. Paul goes on to ask Morgan if she feels an undercurrent of shame when men talk about modesty like Paul did in that clip where he was expressing concern over women wearing bikinis. And she says no, but she didn't grow up feeling shame around modesty in general. Although she emphasizes that there are plenty of things that other Christian men and women have made her feel shame for. And uh, then she goes on to say that she also knows Paul's heart. And so when he made that specific video, she really didn't think anything of it. 
Sydney says that meeting Paul and Morgan in person, she thinks that they are like the coolest people ever, but she still got kind of defensive when she heard that clip and it just kind of made her feel like, ugh, why are men still talking about women's bodies? And then Morgan explained that they had gotten a lot of people who messaged Paul and asked him and Michael to get on video and talk about this topic. And she asked Sydney if knowing this would change Sydney's mind at all. And she was kind of surprised and said that, yeah, like hearing Morgan tell her that it does change her view on that clip specifically. Our next card is 4 p.m. Benson Household. Paul is leading another conversation about the church Chad page, and he asks Josh if he worries about crossing the line at all. Josh explains that at the end of the day, he's still a Christian, and he thinks that um, sometimes people respond better to being called out by those that have the same beliefs as them, and he doesn't think that comedy is good if you're not at least flirting with the line. They then talk about a recent event where apparently Sadie Robertson Huff posted a video dancing to the clean version of Beyonce's Texas Hold'em, and apparently people were pissed. So pissed, in fact, that she ended up deleting the post, but Josh's partner for the page, Caleb, had posted a story supporting Sadie when she was getting all of this negative feedback, and Paul had asked about how Josh, like, I guess, made the decision to post that and support her. And Josh actually said that it was Caleb. It wasn't him who posted it. But when they started getting a ton of feedback on um, the story that had been posted, he was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And he looked at it and he was like, yeah, I I totally support Caleb and what he posted and like supporting Sadie essentially. So um, he says that. And then Paul wants to know if there's ever a song that a Christian influencer shouldn't dance to. And Josh is just kind of like, I, I don't think it would be my place to say that. Like, I can't think of anything if I don't really have an answer to that, basically. And then uh, Paul ends up giving WAP as an example. And Josh says that if he saw a Christian influencer dancing to that, he'd probably be like, oh, yeah, not the best choice. This leads into additional conversation about secular art and how some people are very hypocritical and what they choose to criticize versus what they choose to engage in. Sydney says that some people were being way too intense in Sadie's comment section because there was nothing bad about the part of the song she used and on top of that she used the clean version and she thinks that Sadie has good intentions. Morgan, however, thinks that um, people need to draw a line when it comes to engaging in art from artists who have been openly blasphemous like Beyonce. Sydney says that if that's the approach that people are taking, she's down to have that conversation, but she really thinks that people should consider the intent of the person when they're having an opinion on something that they've done. As an aside, I will say that um, unsurprisingly, this is not the first conversation I've heard Morgan be involved in where Beyonce is described as blasphemous. However, I've never heard an example come from her. I've never heard her be like, oh, she's a blasphemous artist and this is why I believe that. Hasn't happened yet. I remember in a video that Brittany Dawn made about Beyonce being blasphemous, she said something along the lines of like, she is and some of her lyrics I can't even give you examples of. I don't even feel comfortable reading them. And to me, I'm like, well, what's the point in faith? What's, what is the point of believing that you serve a strong, all-powerful God if you can't quote something to educate your audience about what they should be avoiding, right? So anyway, it, it's just like, oh, so this is the narrative that you're pushing again, and yet I have no examples from you of how she's blasphemous. Then they talk about personal convictions versus biblical commandments. A Christian shouldn't be having a large digest of secular music or Josh cusses sometimes. That is seems worldly to me. Josh is okay with this. That seems worldly to me. What would your response? I, I think it's it's like what Bryce said. It's like it's a very powerful thing to believe that you're the one that has the exact line of convictions and things figured you're out. It's, 100% and you're correct. so correct of like this is where the line is drawn and like you know essentially you're compromising your, your walk with Christ if you're anything but this. It's very powerful to believe that. It doesn't always make it true. Uh, and it's most certainly probably not true that you know, you have it figured out and everyone else is, you know, super wrong. I get, because I, growing up, you know, super Southern Baptist, but also kind of my parents being strong believers and things of that nature and small town, you know, people are watching. I get kind of the feeling of like, how could they do that? 
and then how could they you know be a christian you know how, how could they you know partake in this i think just from my end it's just kind of like to the people watching that are like this guy's so worldly and, and questioning my salvation it's like people have different perspectives in, in different life situations from you that mold who they are and, and even more so kind of that reflects in their walk with christ you know the problem we run into is oftentimes and this is kind of where the legalism comes in it's like it's almost never presented like hey guys like this is just a personal conviction of mine mm -hmm. take it it's, it's always this is Bible. if you are a christian and you do this yep. but also we were talking about too like what gets views what oh, gets oh now if we're getting into that christian, you know, uh, right? <laughs> um, and, and so the, the more explosive the title the more explosive yeah. the thumbnail the more black and white you're going to hell yeah. if you do that <laughs> And it's it's just outrageous how much people want to shout that for real, though. It's it's right. It does feel good to tell someone that they're wrong and that you are doing better in your own life. Oh, yeah. It feels great. Sydney ultimately says it's about your personal relationship with Jesus, and if something's getting in the way of that, whatever it is, it has to go. The video then closes out with Paul asking Josh where people can find him, and he shares his own social media information as well as Sydney's, which I thought was cute because. Obviously, this is about like the church Chad page and Josh Benson, but he promotes his wife as well when he gets the chance to and he tells uh, the audience us that she makes lifestyle content. And so I was like, oh, that's cute. I'll, I'll have to go check out her page. Um, I just think, I don't know. I just think it's nice to see a husband being nice to a spouse. Call me crazy. Um, anyway, Paul and Morgan thank the Bensons for letting them come. And Sydney says that she and Josh love this kind of stuff and she would totally hang out with them again. So it does seem like they were able to, in fact, squash some of the aforementioned beef, but they will continue to agree to disagree. End of episode. The only comment that I want to make about that last scene is that when Sydney and Josh were being um, complimentary towards Paul and Morgan and saying that they loved having them there, they would totally do it again, like they would totally hang out with them, it was like Paul, I, I, Paul was proving a point. I think that it really bothers him that there's a large section of people online who aren't super fond of him, like they're not really big fans, and he gets a lot of negative feedback. And so when somebody with a public platform says something nice about him, it's like he's a kid on Christmas. It's it, He like looks at the camera like, see, I'm likable. See, people like me. And to me, that that's unlikable. That's off-putting. I'm like, just be just just interact like you're not trying to prove a point interact like you are there to actually care about what these other people have to say instead of like trying to validate yourself it's just off-putting and i think if i were the person who was there telling paul and morgan like i i enjoyed hanging out with you i would do it again and instead of like taking in the the sincere compliment that i'm giving them and having whatever response they have like giving me a response to my genuine opinion they looked at the camera and did like the yeah see we got them they like us i would just be like oh okay like i'm trying to have a conversation with you um i know we're on camera like i know we're being filmed but we're also supposed to be genuinely and honestly interacting and so that's what i'm trying to do and instead you're being like see people like me I don't know, maybe I'm being too harsh though because I do remember Bethany Beale saying that she and Paul are like similar in the fact that when the camera goes on, they just go into a certain mode and it's like, we're ready, we're on camera, this is our persona, let's roll. So maybe I'm being too judgmental. Maybe I would feel differently if it happened in person, but it does just feel odd as an audience member watching it. So anyway, that... That was the recap. That was their 24 hours with episode uh, with Josh Benson. What did you think? Did you watch it or did you just listen to the recap? And based on the recap, what opinions do you have of it? I would love to hear anything that you have to share down in the comment section below if you are watching this on YouTube or in the Q&A section if you are listening to this on Spotify. And if you would consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel or leaving the podcast a rating or a review, that would be incredible. And if you have done any of those things already, thank you so much. I am so appreciative of you. And I love being able to just sit here, hang out with you and talk about whatever. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Please be kind to people and I will see you in the next one. Bye.